and we are back once again. This uh, is episode three of our young program. And you know, one of the greatest things I've noticed about the Edgar Ortega radio show is that the topics never get boring to me. Why is that? Uh, I suppose the guests are just so darn entertaining. It's good to learn things. Uh, tonight is no exception. As many of you already know, I dabble in snakes and snake-like uh, creatures. One of my friends who shares this strange pursuit uh, is named Andy Ray. He is in the Monterey area, an owner of Area Reptiles. He's uh, with me here now via internet communication device. Andy, welcome to the program. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Edgar. Appreciate it. You staying dry? It's pouring down here. Uh, it was, uh, we had some rain earlier this morning, kind of, it rained through the night, but, uh, this afternoon we've, we've enjoyed a little bit of dryness, so it's nice, <laughs> but hopefully we'll get some more. We need it. All right. Enough about the weather. Let's, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about, uh, our strange interest in, uh, snakes and uh, reptiles. Uh, I understand you share this interest. Absolutely. Love reptiles. Now, for a very long time. Now, you're the owner of Area Reptiles. You, uh, yes, sir. What, 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 sort of, what sort of animals are you working with? Uh, right now, we're, we're primarily focused on carpet pythons, uh, specifically lineage or pedigree quality jungle carpet pythons. Uh, we also have some pedigree coastals that maybe in about three years we'll be, we'll be pairing up, but, uh, uh, also, rosy boas, lo- locality specific rosy boas. I'm not planning on doing any any mixing of any locales, um, so that'll be a very fun uh, adventure there. I've, I've uh, for the first time actually last season was my first successful uh, breeding of rosy boas. I, I was able to get um, uh, Mount Harkahala rosy boas, which are, are typically located in Arizona. Uh, and then also some Bay of LA rosy boas, which was, uh, I had some, some killer animals from both those. So I was really excited last season to get those. Um, and also this season we got zoomeral boas going. So that's another exciting species and one of our, one of our favorites here in the house. Um, so those are the primary species that we're working with right now. That's very cool. Rosy boas are one of my favorites. Um, have you ever gone looking for them? You know what? That's one thing that it, when I was 15, uh, I did a, about a three week spring, spring trip with one of my buddies and, uh, we did not find any at that time. And so we went looking for them, didn't find any, found a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and, uh, so this year in speaking with a few, a few people, a few Rosie Boa people, uh, I, I think I'm going to get hooked up with some really good spots to go. I'm thinking of doing a trip down Southern California into Arizona, maybe dabble into Baja, depending on if I can get back or not. <laughs> you got to make sure you get back too. Yeah. I don't know. About I don't know. Maybe I'll like it down there. Maybe I don't want to come back. <laughs> I don't know. I, th- I think I've had family disappear out in those deserts. Possibly, but maybe me too. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Hopefully, you'll get back okay. I know a guy. He'll, yeah, he'll, I, he'll guide you through there. I, I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't, haven't decided if I'm going to head down there or not because it's going to be a trip with probably just my son and I, um, just a boys' trip for probably like late spring, early summer. We'll we'll see. Um, we're trying to figure out the dates and and in the finances also for the trip and vacation time stuff like that. That's very good. Now, how long have you been into into reptiles, and uh, when did you start breeding them? So, my first initial introduction to reptiles, I mean, it's, it's pretty cliche, but I mean, I spent a lot of time outside of the house. Uh, I grew up in Salinas, and uh, there used to be this this hill beyond my mom's house. It was, car- it was called Cardboard Hill, and right below that, there was a beautiful creek. And, uh, I would spend after, you know, after school hours, if I was home, I'd be down there weekends, I'd be down there. And that started around when I was six, you know, when it was five and six, actually, when it was okay to leave the house for a few hours by yourself. Um, and I would collect as, as many 
uh, ventilous as I, as I could, and as many gopher snakes and as many uh, garter snakes as I could, and I would actually try to populate my backyard uh, <laughs> with as many reptiles as I could so I can have a zoo. And uh, that was that was kind of the start for me. I was just always so fascinated with them. And uh, after about three, four years of doing that and probably decimating the wild population around that creek of reptiles, <laughs> uh, I would say that uh, right around the 13, 14 year old mark, my dad and I, uh, he was a big supporter. My mom did not like reptiles. Um, so I didn't actually get a chance to keep any snakes um, until 10. Um, my parents got a divorce, and so my dad was always cool with it. And he's like, yeah, sure, no problem. You, know, you can get a snake. And so it kind of started from there. And around 13 or 14, we were trying to dabble with, with colubrids and, and some pythons. I was never successful with the pythons because, frankly, there just wasn't much information for me to find out there. And I just – I didn't. I don't think I put enough effort into it. I wasn't that interested in the, in the breeding of the pythons. There was, I had bull python, and I had some berm. Um so I was I was 15 with with about a 17 foot berm and about 14 foot female. This is uh, pre internet days. Yeah, this was pre internet days. Very well. I think there was AOL dial up at that time, but there still wasn't very much. Information. Yeah, you didn't have it throughout every household. It's actually amazing how much uh, the internet changed how uh, people keep and uh, get a hold of reptiles. Um, back then, you know, uh, you're 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 lucky if you could find what you wanted at a pet store, and even then, there wasn't any guarantee it wasn't ripped out of the wild or healthy at all. Exactly. Yeah, we we lost definitely quite a few animals back then. Yeah, yeah, I think it was uh, very different back then. Um, you mentioned uh, how you got into reptiles. Talk to me about the difference between um, when you approach reptiles as like a hobby, you know, like keeping them as a kid uh, for pets. And how it is now that you're running a business and attending the reptile shows. I always enjoyed uh, early on uh, the Sacramento reptile show. It's a lot of fun to go to. And it used to be a lot smaller. I used to enjoy going every year. And then at some point uh, through the Central Valley Herpetological Society or friends, I'd, we'd have a table and we'd actually work the show. Uh, tell me about your uh, experience now going from a hobbyist to a business owner. Or somebody that uh, vends at the shows. Uh, what's how, what's the transition like there? What's the difference there? Uh, that's a great question, actually. Uh, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. That's not messing up your audio too much, is it? Uh, you sound like you're in a can, but we'll, we'll get through it. <laughs> is this better? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. So. Uh, when I look at the business side of things, when I made the decision to finally go toward having a, a legal business, you know, I really didn't want to take the hobby or the joy of, of keeping reptiles out of it. That was, that was my number one uh, goal in doing this was that if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it um, and make sure that, that the joy and the happiness I get from keeping my reptiles is never going to go away. And so for me, I really try to approach it like it's still a hobby. Um, so when I, I, you know, I don't want to see them as, as inventory. Um, I, I know that that logically is on a, from a business standpoint, that may not make sense to some people. But for me, the, the animals, aren't inventory you know I, I don't want to see them as that now i do feeders also for some customers and and you know that i that's a business right there you know that that i don't worry about so much but um it, so that that hasn't changed much for me uh i've had goals for breeding certain species um now i'm just a little more uh motivated to do it so that at some point you know, I could potentially sell some of these animals to to customers that appreciate the species or, or the beauty of those species. Uh, and if I'm able to make a little bit of money to to cover 
that side of the business in terms of investing in quality animals, um, I think it's a win-win for, for all of us. It's a win for me because I get to invest in, in better quality animals and then I'm able to provide something for customers that, that, uh, you know, not, not your typical pet store animals per se. Right. And there's always that balance of, uh, of keeping the amount of animals you have um, healthy with uh, how you want to grow as a business and maintaining that um, all those animals the same way. Um, I, I agree, definitely. I mean, the business side of it, honestly, is secondary. Um, you know, I'm not concerned with becoming the next Donald Trump of the reptile industry. You know, <laughs> I, I don't. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be retiring. Obviously, that's not. Would it be awesome to just breed snakes and, and and clean up poop and pee all day long? I'm probably, I'm sure it probably would be fun, but I, I just, I see so much of the, I hate to say it, man, but there, there's a lot of negatives to um, a large amount of breeding that I see anyway. And I'd rather just not even dabble in that, if that makes any sense. I'd rather keep you know, my selection, very specific, breed those. If, if it's successful, great. Um, and if it's not, then I can wait for the next season and I don't have to worry or stress about, you know, how am I going to feed my family this month or how am I going to pay the bills this month? Um, so and that's why I said, you know, I, I want to keep the hobby first so that I don't lose that joy. And then the business side of it is secondary. Right, no, of course, a lot of people starting a, a reptile business feel the same way. You mentioned your son earlier. Um, one of the things I noticed about uh, your relationship from your Facebook post uh, with your son is uh, you use the care of reptiles, reptiles in general, to teach him a number of uh, important lessons about uh, responsibility, you know, whether it's money or whatever. Tell me about that. Yeah, sure. I, I love talking about my boy. Uh, so he's a, his name is Elijah. He's uh, he's 11 now. And he's had reptiles pretty much around him his entire life. Uh, I'm lucky enough that I have a wife that loves reptiles too. Oh, she likes them too. That makes it, that makes it uh, a lot easier. <laughs> she, has her own, she has her own specific animals that are hers. Her, her baby. Um, I get to care for them. <laughs> she gets to enjoy them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I do a lot of the feeding and the cleaning and stuff, but she does she does quite a bit. Uh, She's got and you trained. My son helps me. I, my my kids are homeschooled, and so while when I'm gone at work, uh, he gets paid. You know, he 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 has his own animals, but he does have uh, an opportunity to earn money to to do some of the work that I may not be able to do um, during the day. Feed some of my my day geckos or anything that's that. that that's a diurnal species. Um, more importantly, though, is that just the consequences that he learns from caring for his own animals. So he's got his own snakes in his room, his own, his own rack. He's got his own breeding program going. And, you know, he, he's responsible for, for caring for them. And if he makes a bad decision or if he forgets, uh, there's going to be consequences to that. You're going to have a sick snake or you're going to have uh, stuck sheds or or uh, a dehydrated snake if he's not if he's not on top of changing the waters and so you know they're kids obviously I, I'm overseeing all that care um, but more importantly for me is that when he grows up and he's a man I want him to be able to make decisions confidently um, be responsible for the things that he's taken on and be accountable and in just when he makes a mistake, to just to own it and learn from it and uh, be a great man, hopefully be a lot better than I am. Yeah, there's lots of great lessons in that. Um, one, you do seem to ha have him, you know, earn the things he wants. I think I've noticed that. And uh, well, when you get into projects like a snake with, with snake breeding, you're obviously not going to succeed every time. I mean, there is that yeah. chance you're going to fail and you will. Um, so I think it, uh, I've seen also from your post that, you know, uh, something doesn't go the right way, uh, you know, stuff happens even if you do everything right, so kids learn about that sort of thing, uh, 
early on. There's lots of great things kids can learn from keeping reptiles or anything like that at a young age. It's great that you do that. Um, and you said your whole family's into reptiles. Your your wife your wife uh, what what she have that you take care of for? <laughs> well, you know, I, it's probably uh, not fair that I say that either because she does have one of her one of the uh, more time consuming animals in our collection is a savannah monitor, and um, her name is Olivia, and so that's her baby. We're actually in the middle of designing a, a new enclosure for her, but uh, so she's got that. Uh, she's got some uh, retics. She has and some retics. So, yeah, she's got two. Uh, okay. <laughs> so she's got she's got two two re, uh, reticulated pythons. She's got a, a female dumeral boa. Uh, she's got some coastal carpet pythons. Some let's say Mexican black king snake. Uh, she's got. Uh, oh man, she's got quite a few. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I know how it goes. Um, no, it's great that she's into them. Some pe- some wives just kind of deal with it, or uh, correct, or uh, you. But you got the whole family involved. That's really great. Um, yeah, we got blue tongue skinks too. That that she she's really stuck on blue tongue skinks right now. So every time she sees uh, Rebecca from Moonshine Reptiles up in the Bay Area, man, she's like, "Oh, I want that one," or "Ooh, I want another one." <laughs> yeah, it's hard to go uh, to a reptile hard- show and not uh, see something else you want. Right. Even my three-year-old has her own snake. She actually has, she's had it for about a year now. And her, she named it Kara all on her own. And, and she asked to help and feed it and change its water. And, um, you know, she knows that it's, it's her snake. And so she's responsible for taking care of it. No, that's great. That's great. Um, as far as uh, you've talked about eventually saving money for you know other projects that you want to work on um yeah you do the carpets you do the uh rosy bow as you mentioned and a few other things as pets what are some uh, future projects what are some dream projects for you what are some animals you want to work with well i'm fortunate enough to say that i'm i'm working on one right now that has been a dream for me since since I was a kid. I remember, uh, you remember Reptiles Magazine, obviously. Uh, yeah, I got stacks um, we of them here. We, we grew up with that magazine. Yes, we did. <laughs> and I, I remember the first time I saw Cover Girl, a jungle carpet python. And I mean, she's famous. She's, I mean, she's an infamous uh, jungle carpet python. And, and I'm fortunate enough to have some of her genetics in my jungle carpet python project. And so... I can say that I'm actually working on one of my dream projects now, um, but other, uh, you know, just beyond that, I, w- I would absolutely love to work with emerald tree boas. That is probably top one or two snakes of my dreams, and I and I know they're readily available. You can pick some up here and there, but I'm I'm saving up a lot of money to. I'm I'm probably going to end up looking for some of the animals that Ed Marino has been producing. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with some of his work. but yeah, you, uh, don't, you don't see a lot of those uh, generally captive bred. Do you see a lot of those for sale? You know, most of the stuff that you see coming in is going to be um, either farm bred or, or wild caught right now. And, and I really don't want to go down that route. I really would prefer to, to support somebody that, that's gone through uh, the effort of, of doing a captive breeding program. Now, I, I do I do understand the, the logic behind getting fresh blood uh, into the state. I get it. Uh, that's just not my focus specifically. I'd, I'd rather go after like some of the diamond Amazon basin, the high white Amazon basin with like incredible diamonds on their back. Um, I mean, I, I spent so many hours inside of the classroom drawing emerald tree boas when I should have been paying attention to teachers, you know? Uh, <laughs> It, I, and that, I always joke with my wife. I was like, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm not very smart is because I dreamt about snakes pretty much like all day long and threw them. And, uh, but the stuff that Ed Marino is doing, I mean, it's just absolutely stunning. And, and he's done such a great job at selectively breeding emerald tree boas. And that's, that's an inspiration to me, you know, doing something the way that he's done it over the last couple of decades. It's, just, it's amazing. No, it's great. Yeah, the emerald tree boas, those are, if you're a hobbyist early on, going through uh, reptiles magazines or the Varium back yeah. in the day. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
it's either that one or the green tree pythons. People fall in love with those very photogenic animals. Um, yeah. They have an interesting, uh, when they're young and then they grow up and they're very different then. Um, that's one of those animals a lot of people zone in on and uh, want to get eventually. So it's very cool. They got some teeth, though, you know. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. I want one for sure that whether or not it becomes a project or if, even if I can just own one would be, of course, the Bowlands Python. Oh, yes. <laughs> that would be absolutely incredible. That, yep. that, that would that's definitely a dream thing. And then you can, if you breed it, then all the more to you, right? <laughs> right, exactly. It, that's a big if. Yeah, there'll be there'll be like four of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question. Um, yeah. I, I I always now tell me if I'm wrong, okay? But now sure. the reptile community seems to be facing an uphill battle when it when it comes to like reptile legislation. Um, there's groups that want to you know. They don't want people to keep reptiles. And the way they work is they kind of one at a time, how to boil a frog, you know, just a little bit at a time, they turn up the heat, one species, one kind of snake. Um, and they basically seek to end the ownership of reptiles. You know that. And well, I, I, I tend to think that they're, they're seeking to end the ownership of pets in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Specifically, uh, I was talking about reptiles, but yeah, we, they, they want to get rid of pets. Groups like PETA, the Humane Society, stuff like that. Um, but it's incremental. Yeah, so, so they start agree. they start with the easy stuff, the stuff that'll uh, pull at uh, either heartstrings or scare you. And then uh, they'll have people support that sort of thing. But anyway, it seems to me that people in the reptile community only get angry about it after a law has been passed, um, while there's a select group of people who support groups like USARC, the United States Association of Reptile Keepers, and other similar efforts that try to preserve our ability to keep uh, reptiles, um, it just seems so darn difficult uh, to unite the community to do anything outside of their uh, own little groups, you know? Um, it's like uh, pulling teeth to get people motivated, and then when something happens... You know, it's too late, but then everyone's complaining. Um, am yeah. I am I wrong here, or uh, what are your thoughts? No, actually, I I, I completely 100% agree with you. Um, you know, I, I think what happens is that we take for granted, you know, some of these freedoms that we do have. Uh, and over time, like you said, they, they start chipping away at some of those freedoms one species at a time. And then, the, you know, with the most recent... You know, over the last couple of years with the Lacey Act and, and uh, the regulations over, you know, uh, Burmese python, for example, we'll use that, that species specifically. Uh, it was too little too late by the community. Uh, the legislation and some of these laws and some of the studies they were doing to use the, to pass that law had been going on for years. And there was... Plenty of opportunity and time for the community to come together. And I, and I will include myself in that, is that I, I, I did not act fast enough in the initial um, studies that they were doing. And, and quite frankly, they weren't being very transparent. But they, I mean, the regulators, uh, they were doing studies without really anybody knowing what was going on. And, and then they just put it out there and said, hey, look, this is what's happening, which was false science, in my opinion, and we need to ban all of the uh, So, of course, that caused an uproar. A lot of people weren't really prepared for it, but now that we've seen it happen, what else are they planning? You know, what else is out there that they would like to get, you know, on that list? And uh, U.S. ARC, I think they're, they're doing what they can with with the resources available to them, but uh, we literally, as a community, I mean, there's millions of reptile keepers, millions of them, and how long really would it take to send a letter to some, to, to somebody? You know, phone, phone calls, um, letters have to be addressed. You know, legally, letters have to be addressed by legislation. Uh, if they get inundated with enough of them, they are... Uh, they're required to take action and, and and address those issues and say, wait, uh, are we doing the right thing here? Um, 
I, I have a I have a, a little bit of a biased opinion on, on some government agencies. I think they overstep their boundaries a little too much. But again, that's something that as a society as a whole, we've given up too many freedoms here, you know, and allow them to chip away at those freedoms so they think they can get away with a lot. Um, so as a community, can we do a better job? Absolutely. Uh, individually, myself, speaking for myself, could I do better? Absolutely. I think we can all we can all rely on each other, motivate each other, and say, hey, look, go write that letter, whether it's an email or a physical letter. Uh, send it to the legislature that, that where you're being affected. Um, it's a lot easier to keep something from happening than to try to reverse it after the fact. Um, That's why I never asked for permission to do anything. <laughs> I say, like, "Oh, I wasn't supposed to do that. I'm sorry." You're right. Yeah. You no. Know, no. Ignorance uh, is a great thing, actually. <laughs> yeah. Now, how do you get people motivated? I mean, the, you, you, you are the founder. You were the president of the uh, Central Coast Herpetological Society. Um, it was a great group. Uh, are, are you guys still meeting? Unfortunately, we're not. And, and it's funny that you, you brought it up because I was just talking with a friend of mine, uh, Riley Jameson, and he, uh, he lives in the Santa Barbara area. And, and I, was, I had mentioned that um, I was the president of the Central Coast Herb Society. And, we, you know, we were doing really well. And the, the, the difficult thing is trying to find enough people with the energy and the time to... Yeah, right. To, how do you get people, a group like that going. How do you keep people motivated to uh, not just show up, but um, you know, help help make it happen? Because uh, it just right. it just magically happens every month, and we show up, and cool stuff is there, and looks like things are going good. Why should I help, right? <laughs> right. Well, and the tough thing was that you know I I spent so much time and and money personally uh, to get that group going, and then. We were going to have our third child. My, you know, we were we were blessed to to find out we were going to have another child, and so we went through it. In the first couple of months, it was it was a really difficult task to to have to pull away from helping my wife with my daughter um, uh, to go and do organize the group or to go or do stuff for the Hurt Society. And it wasn't that it didn't mean anything to me, but it's just that my daughter meant more. No, and right. so when I mean, you're busy. That opportunity came up to ask for help. It just, there were just, unfortunately, there just wasn't enough people to be able to get it going. Now I still want to do another Hurt Society or either reactivate that one or change the name or do something. Cause it's like our, our area is, it, it, I I just love hanging out with reptile people, you know. <laughs> we get to geek out and share stories and laugh, share our animals, and it's such a fun time. But it's really difficult to get people to to engage enough outside of their regularly scheduled lives. Yeah, um, it, it's a to do something like and that. a question of motivation as well. Um, people say they're busy. Well, uh, the people organizing this stuff are busy too. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. So yeah, that's interesting. Um, all right, I mean that's it for now. I appreciate you talking to me. Um, I'm starting to get an echo from you, so I'll go ahead and uh, I think we got through all the questions, so we're good. Um, in the future, we're going to have lots of reptile-related topics. Those will never run dry here on the show. Um, if you have something reptile related or otherwise happening that you feel is interesting enough to discuss, you can reach me at Edgar Ortega Radio on the Facebook page or through the YouTube account. As always, I encourage you to subscribe to my channel, watch for more soon, and be sure to check out our other videos. Uh, bye for now. Andy, thanks again. Thank you. I appreciate it. You have a good evening. All right, you too. Take Bye, care. Bud.